I mean, I have to say, I call this Moroccan roast lamb, but I don't think this is how Moroccans cook lamb, but it's how I cook it when I want to bring Morocco to me. It is just a leg of lamb here, which is transformed so far from your idea of a normal Sunday roast by my magic ingredient, the most wonderful Moroccan spice blend, Ras El Hanout, containing just about every exotic spice you can imagine, and flecked with rose petals. Oh, so beautiful. I have to read this to see exactly what's in it, because there's so much. Galangal, the rosebuds, ginger, cardamom, cayenne, allspice, lavender, cinnamon, and about twice as many as that, including absolutely some nigella seeds. And I need to mix some lemon juice, some minced garlic, olive oil, and some freshly chopped coriander, just for another hit of pungency. And then what I'm gonna do, and I love this bit, is stab the lamb with the end of a sharp knife and push the spice mixture into the holes, smear it over the top, chuck it in a plastic bag and leave it to marinade for an hour or so. I've taken the lamb out of its bag and look, you can see it's still beautifully covered with its marinade. I've preheated the oven to gas mark six, that's 200 degrees centigrade, and I'm gonna give it an hour and a half, by which time it'll be aromatically blackened on the outside, and I do mean charred, but still juicily pink and tender within. I'm travelling eastwards for Morocco for the accompaniment to go with the lamb, this is from Turkey, it's called Jajik, and it's really just a variant of the salads they have all along the Eastern Mediterranean of mint, yogurt, cucumber and garlic. The lamb is about to come out of the oven, so it's a perfect time to make the Jajik. I did peel and chop this cucumber, and this couldn't be simpler, it's just a question of mixing all the ingredients together. So after the cucumber, some wonderful Greek yogurt, and what I love about this is the contrast between the smooth coolness of the yogurt and the heady scentedness of the spiced lamb. Oh, and I love it as well, stuffed into warmed pita breads for a sort of different kind of cucumber sandwich. A garlic clove is what I need. There's more if you want this really hot. It's grated in, mince it in some dried mint, just a sprinkling, and some lovely crunchy salt, and of course, some freshly chopped mint from the garden. Stir it together. now is drizzle with a lovely green ribbon of olive oil. Mm, beautiful. And a final sprinkling of mint. Perfect. Chilies are crucial in spare ribs, I think, because although I love all that familiar resonant stickiness, what I don't want is jamminess, so I need fire and heat, and chilies really provide that, and freshness as well, which is important. Chilies, mm. the ginger and spring onions, and the spare ribs themselves. You can get these, you know, in the supermarket these days, but if not, Ask a butcher. Okay, so we're ready for the off. Now first, some rice wine vinegar. 
for sourness because all barbecue has to have a sour element as well as a sweet. About four tablespoons, which is 60 ml, is about it. Slight less soy, about three tablespoonfuls. Yum. Some toasted sesame oil, not a lot, just enough to give that aromatic nuttiness. And now ordinary oil, ground nut or vegetable, about two tablespoonfuls. Okay, the same amount of honey, about two tablespoonfuls worth. Runny honey, not that thick, solid stuff. Mm. Now, staying with sweetness, I want cinnamon. And I like to crumble it in like this, not use ground cinnamon. In the same note, some star anise, a couple. Throw them in. And now ginger, quite a bit of it. Just tumble in these golden spikes. Four spring onions, just roughly chopped. Now the chilies, two lovely fat red juicy ones. Tumble these in. And in these ribs go, I've got 16 here, but I don't know how many people you're going to be cooking for. Mm. Really move everything about so that the marinade thinly coats the ribs all over. I'm going to get the roasting tin out now so I can just leave them in here marinating while I clear up and then they can just go in the oven. Right, well these have had as much as I'm going to give them the marinade, so I'm just going to tip them into the tin. Really make sure to squeeze every last bit of marinade and all these lovely fresh chunky bits of taste. Smoosh them about so everything is still covered and the ribs need to be cooked partly covered and then for a while uncovered so just stick some foil on them now and get them into a hot oven number six 200 start the process off. <laughs> about an hour for this bit. I make my ribs a bit firier than a lot of people would, but then I love hot food. I mean, I think it's compulsive. And the fact I once did read a paper which explained that there's something in chilies which makes them chemically addictive. And I have to admit, I am a complete heat junkie. The food I like eating most is the food that bites back. I mean, so pitiful, I have to say, is my addiction to chilli that just in case I'm out of my home without a source of heat, I carry these little baby bottles of Tabasco in my bag and then I know I'm going to be okay. I mean, it's that bad. But I have quite an array of chilli sauces from around the world, all of which are deeply necessary to me. Peperoncini. This is very old, you can see. These are little dried red chilli peppers. I mean, they've lost their redness, but boy, they have not lost their heat. And they can really give depth to the simplest pasta supper. Just fry some slithered garlic and one to two crumbled chilies and stir through some hot drained spaghetti. Serve with a sprinkling of fresh parsley, spaghetti aglio olio. Simple, sensational and life-giving. Sambal Ehrlich. I love this. It's very hot chilli from Indonesia. Really, this is just salted, pounded chilies, so you get all the texture and all the heat. It's my secret for instantly transforming a comforting roast chicken to a fire-giving, chilli-hot dinner. Just smear the skin with sambal ehrlich and roast in an oven at maximum temperature. Addictive. Sweet chilli dipping sauce from China. Now, sweetness and heat go very well together. Okay, this is a strange combination, but I beg you to try it. Ice cream with red hot chili syrup, made by boiling a cupful each of water and sugar, then pouring it over a finely chopped chili. Take my word for it, it really works. Feel lit up and soothed at the same time. Well, those ribs should have had about an hour. Just unveil them. 
Now they look a bit pale and that's because at this stage I'm going to put on some honey and some five spice powder and then turn up the heat so that they get sticky and glazed. About two generous tablespoonfuls worth of honey mm. and about two teaspoons of five spice powder and then in this really hot oven it's which is about gas eight to 30 centigrade they will need about 30 minutes more but you have to watch just turn them occasionally so that they get really sticky and sort of thick with glaze and what I love to do at the end is add a final sprinkle of earthy hot coriander and really deep heat some more fresh red chilies. Perfect. Now you can see these ribs are scorched and glazed. Right. Tong away. Oh. I love all that sort of conker, shiny, resonant stickiness. Just pile them up on top of one another because they go down very quickly. Now a final red and green sprinkling, the coriander and chilli. Mm. And this one is mine now. Mm. Mm. So I'm going to fry some lamb chops a la romana, or at least dipped in egg, breadcrumbs, and then fried in olive oil till very, very crunchy. First of all, because there is always room for a bit of brutality in the kitchen, a bit of cling film, some small lamb cutlets trimmed of most of their fat. Though I have to say in Rome they have teeny weeny lamb cutlets. I mean the eye of the chop is about that big. Each of them does feel a bit like the Massacre of the Innocents. And then another layer of cling film on top. And then you just thwack. If you've got a mallet, use that. I don't. In any way, I think hitting things with a rolling pin is much richer in comic potential. These really only need a couple of minutes each side just so they're crispy crunchy coating goes golden and for that reason they should really be at room temperature before they go into the hot oil. Right. Now it's before I start getting the egg and the breadcrumb right I'm just going to pour some oil in because I want this to heat up ordinary not extra virgin. You can see that it's yellow rather than that thick oozy green. It's hard to say exactly how much. It's really easy just to reckon on filling a pan up to about a centimetre's depth and obviously the dimensions of your pan will determine how much oil that needs. Okay, on with the oil. Okay, time for some dipping and dunking. First eggs, just a couple. These are Italian eggs, you can see they're lovely golden yolks. Salt and pepper and season them well because you want these to be intensely savoury and it's just a question of whisking to combine this is really just a glue for the breadcrumbs later you don't need to get it frothy or anything now into the breadcrumbs you want a great a good 10 grams of parmesan and that's probably enough to fill an american quarter cup full pretty generously anyway i'll just go by eye now Breadcrumbs are not difficult to make, but it's slightly tedious. You have to get good bread, you have to leave it to go stale, and then you have to grate it all or process it. And I found the easiest way of making breadcrumbs quickly is just by getting some pita bread, splitting it in about 20 minutes it's dried out, and then you just need to process them. And I've really processed three pita breads here. That comes to about 175 grams of ordinary breadcrumbs. Right, just mix the cheese into the breadcrumbs. Mm. Very therapeutic. Okay, now it's just a question of dipping the chops first in the egg and then in the parmesan sprinkled breadcrumbs. Just wadge it in and heat the stuff over. I find that easier to press on. 
This is a really wonderful weekend cooking because children love doing this. And while I might not exactly leave them alone for a bit of deep frying now, you can leave them alone at this stage. And I'm a great believer in child labour in the kitchen. Have to be some compensations. So, just in. And I wouldn't do more than about three in a pan of this size at one time, otherwise the heat will drop too much. And it's that which makes fried food get greasy. If you cook in hot fat like this, everything stays so crisp and light. Now, see? I'll just turn these over. Oh, lovely. Just a minute or two on each side until the crumbs are a deep, deep gold. You know, this is so simple, so quick. You could make huge batches of this and cook them all before a picnic without breaking into the merest hint of a sweat. I mean, look at that. Isn't it beautiful? just want to bite straight in at the risk of taking all the skin off the roof of my mouth. If anything could make a picnic bearable, it would be these. Just gotta crunch straight in, isn't it? Mm. Mm. For a perfect picnic hamper, partner the crispy lamb chops with my fail-safe, low-effort potato salad. Just scoop out the scorched flesh of a few baked potatoes when they're cold and souse them in cumin, lemon juice, salt and olive oil and a scattering of spring onions. For a green salad that won't wilt or go soggy however long it sits in its tub, try fennel simply dressed with lemon juice, oil and salt and the finely chopped fronds that feather the top of the bulbs. 